Hello again! Today I present you my Brainfuck Interpreter. For those of you who don't know, Brainfuck is a very interesting programming language. And yes, I'm aware that this is by far not the first Brainfuck Interpreter or computer in Minecraft. I've seen a few, very impressive ones, but this is at least the first one that I personally built, and I'm using for this a feature that was introduced in the latest snapshots, so see it as a demonstration for that feature. Of course, the world download is in the description below, and if you want to play around with this thing, I will now show you how to operate it. And here we are at the control panel. The first thing we need to do now is to specify the space we actually will need for our program. That means we need to specify how many memory cells we need and how many commands we will be able to use. And for that you see on the right side currently memory cells, program cells and input. Three values for control panel. These six buttons here on the right side, we can change input to anything we want. And by pressing one of those buttons, we can copy the current value of input into, for example, program cells. Well, let's make it a little bit smaller here. Put that in memory cells. And now that we have specified how much space we need, we can actually start building it. For that we press this button here. Now we wait a second. There we go, memory is ready, and the program is also ready to receive our program. And that happens in here. Eight buttons for eight different commands, that's brainfuck, and also one um, delete button for the last comments. So let's say, for example, um, make an output, then add one, make another output, add another one, make an output, then maybe add another one, add another one. Oh no, you know what, let's delete the last two, let's take two subtractions, make another output, and uh, you can see I have not used all the program cells available, but that's no problem. Only problem would be if I would uh, need more space than I actually have. You can see output 0, 1, 2, and 0 again. So this was surprisingly nine steps. Yeah, this number you see at the bottom program ended after nine steps is usually one higher than it should be. There's a little bug. Anyway, uh, that's how you enter your first program and if you want to run it again or make a new program, you have to first reset it. And then after that's done, we prepare our memory again, the values are still stored, and then we can enter our program again. And this time I want to show you this debug feature here. Um, let's make a simple multiplication. So if I now start the program, let's keep the debug info on. By the way, you can switch them anytime during the program, that's no problem. You currently see now I need to confirm my input. I currently have uh, set 4. Let's keep that. Or let's keep it down a bit. Let's make it 3. Confirm input. And now he's processing the commands. Gives some inputs here, or outputs. It also gives you error messages if something happens. I can at any time turn it off if I don't want to see it, but um, then you will lose the flow if you really want to debug your program. Because through the whole system, it's to jump back again. Standard brainfuck procedure. And there we go. 50 steps, output is 6. That's correct. 2 times 3 is 6. So, also you see uh, in the last line, command not found. That's an error message that appears because he tries to operate one last step after the program is finished. So, ignore that program is ended before, so everything worked right. Yeah, that's uh, how you operate this beauty. Let's have a look uh, at how it looks on the redstone side. Just a quick look. Alright, I've set it up to calculate 6 times 4, so we should have plenty of time to look at it while it's running. The first thing you'll notice, of course, if you load the world, is the actual control panel up here. And this is really nothing more than setting scoreboard values. 
It's mostly convenience. I can do that all by hand with using scoreboard commands, but this is just more convenient to interface. Um, those command blocks do some more stuff also, but it's really in the end just to set scoreboard values. Then down here we have the memory. This thing here and there, the minecarts you can see, those are the memory cells. This is actually a memory tape. And how that works, I will explain that in the later part, it's by using the new feature, so to speak. Then uh, we have these additions to the memory. Those bits are responsible for creating the items and filling in the default values and programming. And that's what happens when we press that button over there. Then we have some more floaty bits around here, the, with a few command blocks, and those are simple functions that I need to call from time to time to copy stuff over like in an output and uh, make comparisons and all that stuff. Not too important, but convenient. And then we have the heart of the system, of course, the decoding that happens in here. We have eight different command blocks that detect eight different commands and some error detection here. And uh, each one makes a simple function. Well, maybe in case of loops, that's not so simple. That's what we have these little additions here too. They are responsible for the jumps. You currently see one jumping forward. And yeah, they handle the loops. So this is a quick overview. Output 24. Nice. That worked. And if you want to know exactly how this works in detail, how I set this up, uh, let me know because for a standard video this might get a little bit boring and lengthy, so I decide not to do it in here. Anyway, uh, I want to show you the feature that I used for the memory. That's what this whole thing demonstrates, so to speak. And for that I will need to go to a new world. See you there! For a while now we were able to store values for non-existing players in the scoreboard. So a command like this would still be valid and set the value for a player called fake to 1. Those names didn't have to be real players, they don't have to be even valid names for players. So 1, 2, 3 works just fine, or very long names work just fine as well. As long as the scoreboard can store it somehow, it's okay for it to store the value for that name. The only problem so far was that we couldn't receive the values again. We could store them, but we had no way to tell if it was a 1, a 2 or 3. A selector like this doesn't work for fake players, because it can only target existing entities that are currently in the game. So this will give no output. Luckily, in the current snapshot we got some additions to scoreboard. One of them is the test command here, with which we can test for a specific value for specific players, even for fake ones. So this command will give us a positive output. Very nice addition, but one problem here. We have to know the exact name of our variable, of our fake player. That means for every variable we have, we have to use a different command, and potentially a different command block with that. So as long as you only have a few variables to control something, no big problem. But imagine you want to have 100 different variables. You would have to use 100 different command blocks. Not so ideal. But there's a little trick you can use. Let's have a look at this. If I summon in an entity and use the say command and the new entity selector with it, I can see the name of that item I just spawned in in the chat. And also if I hover over it, you can get some additional information, like the stack size and down there you see this weird combination of letters and numbers, 9, 1, E, C, C and so on. That is the UUID of that item entity, the universally unique identifier. You can think of that as a very special name that only this entity will have and no other entity will ever have the same name. So with that we can differentiate between different entities no matter how many we have. At least it's so incredibly unlikely that we'll ever get an entity with the same name that you can really ignore that chance. Now this UUID normally gets used and for example the say command to specify of which entities we want to output the names. Or in case of the teleport command this specifies which entities we want to teleport. The UIDs provided by the entity selector get used in a 
a useful way by the commands. But what happens if the command doesn't use UUIDs? That would be the case, for example, with the scoreboard command. In this case, I will add the value 1 in the objective O to a player specified by the UUID of the nearest entity. Now press this button, you can see the UUID appears as a player name. And that's the whole trick here. The UUID of that entity is now the same as the name of a fake player, and so we can reference it. I can just add more values to that number. And the nice part is, if I just um, move that away and spawn a new one in, I can access a different value, a different fake player, using a different entity with a different UUID. But I'm still using the same command block and the same command. So I can use one command block to access different values. All I have to do is switch around some entities, which is pretty easy to do with, for example, the teleport command. You can see I changed one variable, 7, 8. Let's switch back, add values to that one, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So with this I can use a lot less command blocks, but can access a large quantity of different variables. Very easily, very modular. Actually, quite nice trick. I don't know if that was intended or not, but I hope they keep it in the game. Now let's have a look back at the memory cells. And we, here we are back again. You're currently looking at the working memory of the system. We have in here four minecarts. Each one represents one item in the scoreboard, or one fake player in the scoreboard. Let me quickly show you them. These are the four values I store for the memory, the four fake players, and to address them I use those four items. And I imagine this to be a memory tape. So when I want to address a different variable, I just move the whole tape. For example, I want to move my pointer on the tape to the right. That means I have to move my tape to the left. So I will teleport the center item here, which is currently always targeted as active cell, to the left. And then we'll teleport in the next item from the right to the center. So with this, I can address now a different variable. Or press it again and get again different variable. Or I can move back again to get back to the old cells. And that is the whole trick. Just using item UUIDs as address to get access to different variables on the scoreboard. Very simple form of memory. A lot of potential users I see there. And uh, well, in my case, I just had a little bit of fun with BrainFuck. It's very addicting after a while. So I guess thank you for watching and see you next time.